Welcome to season four of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former Commissioner of Health in Baltimore City. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to current topics in public health through engaging interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, our topic is the microbiome. In fact, if there is only one podcast you listen to this year about the microbiome, let it be this one. I speak to Yotam Suez, a faculty member here at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, about the billions, I'm sorry, trillions of microorganisms that live inside us and all over our skin. Do they cause disease? Can they cure disease? And what do diet sodas have to do with it? Let's listen. Dr. Suez, thank you so much for joining me to talk about the microbiome. So I know that the microbiome is in our gastrointestinal tract, but I probably couldn't stand up and give a lecture about it. What is the microbiome from your perspective as an expert? Well, first of all, Josh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about the microbiome today. So when we say microbiome, we think about the trillions of microorganisms that live predominantly in our digestive tract, but virtually everywhere inside and on top of our body, so also on our skin. So when we say microorganisms, we think about bacteria, but also viruses and fungi and many other unicellular organisms that live in our body. And so trillions in each person? Trillions in each person, but not the same trillions. So I think one of the most exciting features about the human microbiome is that we each have a a distinct human signature. So you and I, we have different microbes in our body. And this is why the microbiome is so exciting in terms of medicine, because we can harness that heterogeneity for multiple aspects of disease prevention and treatment and prediction. So if I'm hearing you right, the microbiome isn't just a passive set of trillions of passengers on our body, that it's actually interacting with our body in different ways. Is that right? That's 100% correct. So we've known that we have microbes in our body for almost a century, but for many, many decades, we didn't really know what they were doing. I think about maybe, let's say, 50, 60 years ago, we started understanding they can help us in digesting our food, that they can protect us against invading Uh, disease-causing pathogens like E. coli, salmonella. Um, And that's most of what we knew, although even back then we called them kind of the the good bacteria. What we can say today is they're not just good bacteria or bad bacteria, they're they're essential bacteria. They're just like any other organ in our body. They're critical for the proper development of nearly every system in our body, not only the digestive tract, but also the brain and the nervous system. And of course, most importantly, our immune system. And just like every other organ in our body, it's essential and critical, but also if something goes wrong in that organ, then we have disease developing. Wow, that's such a clear explanation. And it's also intimidating to think that I'm not just me, I'm me plus the trillions of microorganisms that I carry around with me. Right. We often say jokingly that you're more bacteria than human. If you just count how many bacteria are in our body, or specifically if you count how many unique genes they have, there are 100-fold more bacterial genes in your body than human genes. So in a way, uh, you're more bacteria than human, but regardless, they're just as important as our human genes for our well-being. So now I'm especially curious to hear about how you study the microbiome in the lab. What is your work about? Right. So here at the Department of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology at the Bloomberg School, our lab is trying to specifically understand the mechanisms for which the microbiome affects human health. And even more specifically, how person-to-person differences in the microbiome configuration can lead to differential disease risk or differential responses to therapeutics and diets. So you're, you're saying that because our microbiomes are different, you are trying to figure out how they're different. 
and what the meaning of that difference is for different issues in health. So we want to understand, we already know that if you take nearly every human condition or disease, inflammatory bowel disease, obesity, cancer, and you would compare the microbiome of individuals with that condition to healthy individuals, you would see a different microbiome. But one thing that we don't know is, A, whether the microbiome is indeed causing or is involved in causing that disease, and more importantly, how the microbiome is causing the disease. And we think that if we understand how the microbiome is causing the disease, then we can specifically target those mechanisms to prevent or to treat these conditions. In a way, you're developing the personalized medicine of the microbiome. Is that true? That would be an accurate, yes. We hope to develop these therapeutics, yes. So this makes me wonder about whether some generalizations about the microbiome are true. For example, we hear that probiotics are good after you take antibiotics, that probiotics replace your microbiome after you take antibiotics. Is that true for everybody? Well, I can definitely say that this is a very common assumption. And one thing that we do understand is that antibiotics, in addition to their desired effect against the uh, bacterial pathogens, they also target the microbiome. And we know that this is in, indeed associated, this reduced diversity of the microbiome is associated with elevated disease risk. So especially in, in early life, in young children, disrupting the microbiome with antibiotics can increase the risk for diseases such as IBD, metabolic syndrome, allergies, asthma. So for sure, we want to find a way to protect the microbiome from the detrimental effects of antibiotics. And indeed, one of the common assumptions is that if you take probiotics that would facilitate the recovery of the microbiome or protect the microbiome from the effect of the antibiotics. And what we have found is actually quite surprising is that when individuals take antibiotics and then they take probiotics, if we compare them, their microbiome to what happens to individuals that don't do anything at all after taking antibiotics, so they recover spontaneously from the antibiotics. In those people that take antibiotics and then probiotics, the probiotics, the probiotics actually inhibit the recovery of their microbiome. So they prevent the microbiome from returning to what it was before the antibiotics. Now, we still don't know what are the clinical implications of that. We still can't say that this would in fact increase your risk for various diseases. But this is definitely a concern that we think should be looked up further. So in other words, it's, it's not so simple. It is definitely not simple. Now, I know you've done some very interesting work on artificial sweeteners like saccharin or NutraSweet and the role of the microbiome in how those sweeteners work. Can you explain that to me? Sure. So... You know, for, for the past few decades, I think, let's say the last three or four decades, we're seeing a dramatic increase in the prevalence of obesity and diabetes throughout the world, not just in the United States. And we're constantly trying to find strategies uh, that would help people lose weight or normalize blood glucose levels uh, to prevent these diseases. And of course, diseases associated with them, like cancer, like cardiovascular disease, stroke. And one of the most common strategies is to replace in our diet the caloric sweeteners with non-caloric sweeteners. So instead of drinking a beverage that is sweetened with regular sugar, we would drink a beverage that contains saccharin, sucralose, aspartame, stevia. And what we previously saw is that counterintuitively, in individuals that consume these non-caloric sweeteners, it actually elevates their blood glucose levels. So it levels. So it actually contributes to the risk of developing diabetes. Right. So what you're saying is when they took the, the sweeteners that weren't sugar, their blood sugar went up more. So it didn't go up more than when they were drinking regular sugar, but it did go up, which is something that we don't expect because our assumption is that these sweeteners are metabolically inert and they don't have any negative effect, not on our weight and not on our blood glucose. And this is not what we saw. We saw that they can indeed elevate blood glucose. So where does the microbiome come into that? So what we saw is that the risk for developing this negative effect was not the same between different individuals. Some individuals indeed had elevated blood glucose when they consumed non-caloric sweeteners, but others didn't. And we were able to see that those that responded had a different microbiome than those that did not respond. And only in those that responded, the sweeteners were able to disrupt 
the microbiome. So what we think is happening is that some part of the population is more susceptible to the effect of the sweeteners because they have a different microbiome. And in these people, the sweeteners then disrupt the microbiome to produce this negative effect on our metabolic health. But what we still don't understand are the mechanisms. And this is what we're trying to study here now at Hopkins. So you may be trying to make the world a little bit safer for diet soda, among other very important goals. <laughs> um, our, our goal is to find better means to helping people treat or prevent metabolic disease. And we think that if we can help people identify if they are permissive or not to this risk, then maybe they can choose the proper dietary strategy for them. Got it. Well, metabolic disease is an enormous public health threat. And, you know, so many millions of people suffer the consequences. It sounds like your research is really zeroing in on the microbiome and its role in metabolic disease, uh, a whole new frontier for basic science and ultimately clinical medicine. Yes. So I think maybe one of the breakthroughs in microbiome research after many decades that it was almost neglected is when we saw for the first time that the microbiome can actually cause obesity. So these were works that were done in mice, but they were able to demonstrate that if you take the microbiome from an obese individual compared to the microbiome from the twin of that individual that was not obese, just by transferring the microbiome into a mouse that had no microbiome before that, you can make that mouse obese. And this was the first example ever that the microbiome can cause disease and specifically a metabolic disease. And this is, I think, what made many people today interested in the microbiome. Well, you've got me much more interested in the microbiome than I was before we started this conversation. It is really um, fascinating. I'm still wrapping my head around the fact that there's more bacterial DNA in me than human DNA. And uh, I hope that I guess, I hope it stays that way, I guess. So I um, really appreciate the work that you're doing and how important it is to better understand the causes and contributors to disease and opportunities for treatment. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, CN Oates, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo and Neiman Outland. Social media support from Brenda Hagater, Grace Holes-Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening. <laughs>